Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first International Applied Microbiology Conference. It's my pleasure today to introduce our panel discussion, which will be about thinking about making a move to the UK. You will have the opportunity today to listen to three inspirational stories from our speakers about their personal experience in moving from their home country to the UK, either for work or for pursuing their studies. Also for people who are interested in pursuing their studies in the UK, you will have the opportunity to ask questions to an expert in recruitment to UK universities. So I would like to introduce our speakers for this session. Our first speaker is Dr. Lucas Wajda. Dr. Wajda completed his master's and made an early switch from academia to industry, moving from Poland to the UK and worked in the food safety sector. After two years, he was awarded a scholarship to start his PhD at the University of Greenwich. And I'm happy he withdrew from the program and moved back to Poland where he completed his PhD research in 2018. Shortly after his final Viva, he started working in the biotech industry and currently he is planning to move to Ireland to start his new role in industry. Our second speaker for today is Dr. Yinka Samorin. Dr. Yinka is a research fellow at Queen's University Belfast. He obtained his bachelor and master degrees from Nigeria. In 2012, Yinka obtained a PhD scholarship at the National University of Ireland, Galway. After his PhD, he moved to England in 2017 and worked as a visiting lecturer in medical microbiology at the University of Bedfordshire and R&D scientist at Mast Group, then moved to Belfast to pursue his current role. Our third speaker for today is Patricia Minnes. Patricia is the Recruitment and Events Officer for the Faculty of Medicine, Health and Life Sciences at Queen's University, Belfast. Patricia uh, promotes student recruitment for the faculty in both domestic and international markets. Patricia coordinates recruitment events and managing contact with prospective students and their families, agents, careers, advisors. And finally, finally I'm delighted to join this session as one of the speakers for today. I am Zina Al-Fahel, a final year PhD student at the School of Pharmacy at Queen's University, Belfast. I obtained my pharmacy degree from Al Ain University, United Arab Emirates in September 2018, before moving with my husband and son to the UK to start my PhD. During my PhD journey, I had the opportunity to work as a teaching assistant to undergraduate students and to work a part-time job as a clinical trial coordinator for Novavax COVID vaccine at the Northern Ireland Clinical Research Facility. Also, I had the chance to act as an international student ambassador and a postgraduate chair at Queen's, at Queen's University, Belfast. I hope you will benefit from our session today and from our different experiences. Please feel free to type all your questions in the question function that can be found to the right-hand side of the screen. Just click ask a question and then enter your name. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zina. Thank you for the introduction and welcoming our uh, our audience. Uh, you mentioned that you moved to the UK with your son and your husband. Uh, so could you please tell us how, uh, what kind of impact did it have on you and your son? Because obviously you were separated from your parents and your son was separated from his grandparents. Uh, how did you manage with, uh, with that situation? Yes. So of course, it's not an easy experience to move from... Uh, different uh, country to another country and even especially that it's far away it's not the same region either so moving from the middle east to european countries is a little bit difficult but at the same time i have a target i want to finish my phd i want to learn so it was um, a very nice experience uh, we have to adapt to new different lifestyles but this was very good and very interesting for us my son he was also he loved the, uh, the weather here he loved the uh, his friends, his school. So we adapted all of us as a family very well here at the, in the UK. Uh, brilliant. Then, uh, then it looks that it's it's very manageable, especially if you have uh, the support from your other significant half. And how was it for you, uh, Inka, when you first moved to the UK? Uh, thank you very much, Lucas. So uh, for me, it was. Um, I did my PhD in Ireland and um, my wife had been in the UK for quite a while then. So I'd been traveling back and forth visiting. So when I finished my PhD and joined, uh, the first thing was you know, to to start looking for a job. And we also had a, a, a little child who was um, in a few months. So 
it was um, a bit tough in the sense that we had to you know, sort out childcare as well as uh, myself starting to look out for, for jobs after finishing the PhD. But it was um, a good opportunity came up uh, as a visiting lecturer in Bedfordshire. It was just like a 10 minutes train from, from home where we were living in Bedford. So I was covering for um, a maternity lecturer. So basically it was hourly paid. But before I got my microbiology job, I had to do other jobs just to uh, not keep body and soul together and all of that. But it was a good experience. It was a good opportunity. And um, I'm so glad that having done that for a while and the contract was ending, the next thought was, no, what next? And um, well, I worked briefly at the industry, which um, I think was fine. I, I enjoyed the team that I worked with, but I didn't see myself working there long term. So. Um, got the opportunity in Belfast and I had to do traveling. So for my PhD, I had to travel back and forth. Even now, my my wife was a postdoc at uh, Crown Field University when I came in to the UK. So I was doing Bel- Liverpool and um, Crown Field first and then Belfast, Crown Field. And eventually my wife got um, a lectureship at um, Strathclyde in Glasgow. So at the moment, I still do my traveling back and forth, uh, which uh, is a bit tough, but you know, on the professional journey, that's a bit of sacrifice. We decided we're going to pay and uh, it's paying off. So thank you. <laughs> um, yes, it's, it's, it's so great, you know, to see so much optimism and, and positive energy when you, when you talk about this. I can only imagine how difficult it is, but I can see that you can handle that very well. And Patricia, since you are working with international students, what could you tell us? Uh, what are the major problems, how, how students deal with the separation from their families? Yeah, I think um, it's it's really hard, especially with you guys. You've got, you know, your families and leaving. And for some people, they'll be moving to the UK for the first time. So they've got a lot to deal with. There's a whole cultural difference. There's the weather um, as well. There's so many things on. But I suppose I'm going to be talking from Queen's University perspective. But I know that a lot of other universities will be the same. But there's so much support as well within the universities. Um, and I mean, if you're applying as a student, you may be coming through an agent. Um, but within that university, we've got dedicated teams. Um, a student might decide to come and stay in our accommodation. And for example, we have got maybe apartments set up for more families. And um, there is resident um, assistance there to sort of help you move in, to meet people, meet friends. And even once you then um, start going into the schools and start doing your work as well, there's lots of connections that you will make that university staff that we would point in the right direction and so it's just really making those connections earlier on and you know as well whenever you're thinking about applying get in touch with the university and you know you'll have you'll probably give them um, contact names and get in touch with those people and if they can't help you we'll put you through the right department what's about visas accommodation maybe like suggestions of like areas to live in so that's the best thing is just to keep that communication up and then once you find you'll be able to meet those people in person once you get here and you'll meet friends and you'll have a whole network of people that can help with that transition because it is a very big move to be coming across so it is that's great patricia (laughs) thank you so my question now is for lucas so lucas i mentioned earlier that you moved from poland to to the university of greenwich but you didn't continue your phd there and you came back to poland to to pursue your uh, phd so can you tell us more about your experience from moving to poland to to the uk and why did you decide to not continue in the university of greenwich and come back to poland and uh, from your experience, what do you think is the uh, differences uh, between uh, studying in a UK university and in a Polish university? Okay, that's an excellent question. I, I hope that I'll be able to answer uh, quite briefly and within the time frame that we have. Uh, so as you mentioned before, when you introduced me, uh, I first started to work in the industry, but the urge uh, for pursuing my career in, in science was still there. Uh, so when I got the scholarship from the University of Grange, I was ecstatic. You know, it was a very, very important day for my life. However, the main problem uh, which was there 
uh, I think related to the topic that I was working on. Because after I carried out some preliminary studies, uh, it turned out uh, that it is a dent, a dead end that we won't be able to, uh, there's no reason to continue that research. And my supervisors uh, decided to change uh, the topic of my uh, PhD. And to be honest, I didn't like it. I, I already knew back then that I wanted to focus on microbiology, but they wanted to uh, change my top, uh, change the subject of my PhD more to uh, food technology, which okay, that was my first, uh, that was uh, I did my masters uh, in that area, but I didn't necessarily want to continue in that particular field. Uh, so I had to make a very difficult decision. Believe me, it wasn't an easy one. Because obviously, when uh, you need to quit, uh, you need to admit before yourself that uh, uh, you were wrong about something. But uh, trust me, uh, we need to allow ourselves to be wrong from time to time. We don't need to be right all uh, all the times. Uh, so uh, when I moved back to Poland, I started my PhD quite immediately because the supervisor of my master thesis offered me a position uh, in her team. Uh, if I could make some comparisons, then I think that in the UK, you can focus more on your PhD rather than uh, on other duties that are delegated to you by your supervisors. That's the first thing, uh, which is actually uh, very helpful when you carry out your first independent research. Uh, also, um, uh, in Poland, uh, you are definitely more involved in teaching. It, it is like a part of your PhD. It, it is supposed to be a training before you become a, a researcher and an academic te a teacher at the same time. Uh, well, the time uh, that I spent on my PhD helped me to realize that I'm more suited for, uh, for the industry rather for, for academia. Uh, okay. So since then, I continued my, uh, my, uh, my career uh, in the industry. That's great. Thank you so much, Lucas. Thank so you. now my question is for Yinka. So Yinka, you came from Nigeria, then to Ireland, then to the UK. So uh, what can you talk to people who want to study outside Nigeria or move from Nigeria to, to the UK to study? What can you give them some tips from your experience? Uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages from moving from your home country to the UK? Okay, thanks very much, Zina, for that. Um, I probably would start with the, the differences and then tips on, on how to do that. So um, to start with, the difference is that in Nigeria, it's mostly when you have to do postgraduate studies or research for your master's, your PhD, most of the time, you fund yourself. So you pay your fees, you pay your research, uh, bench fee, and all of that. But most of the time, depending on the routes that you come into um, the UK or uh, haven't been to Ireland also, if you are funded, if you, you are fortunate to get a scholarship before you left, you are sure that those financial um, <laughs> stresses would be a little bit off your shoulder because you can then focus on the research that you want to do. So that's the um, opportunity and the privilege I had. So I got my funding uh, from the university, the, the university and you, I go, we had um, a college of science fellowship, which I got and um, the supervisor got in touch with me because I had applied for a previous scholarship that I didn't get and he felt, oh, my application was competitive enough. This is the research I do in my lab. Are you interested in it? And I was able to find some alignment between my background, my research experience, having published before and all of that. And um, that helped me to get that um, fellowship. So doing my PhD there. And um, now my spouse did a PhD in the UK. So I have some experience of how it worked also. But what I would advise anyone who wants to do, uh, who wants to do um, higher degrees research in the UK would be first to do their homework. And what I mean by the homework is know the, the university or the research group you want to belong to know what they do. What's important would even be um, contacting one of the students, current students there. How does this work there? Um, what's the supervisor like? 
what's the research environment like? What's the, the general city or town of the university like? So you are better prepared before you go in into the place because you can judge if that's the best situation for you, if that's the best circumstance for you to thrive and do uh, your PhD research or your master's learning um, in those environments. So very important, get in touch with people who are there. Do your homework, check the website. I know most university and where we work at Quinch University has um, very useful resource on the website. Check those, even if it's for work, the, the university here has um, a very good international staff network. People are happy to you know, give advice and tips about how things work um, in the university here in the UK. So um, that would also be another, another very useful um, area to, to, to contact. Uh, thank you for the tips, Inka. So my question now is for Patricia. So Patricia, you are a recruitment officer at Queens, and you're dealing with the, the students even before they come to the UK. So what do you feel that the most uh, challenges or even questions that the international students ask or they are even worried about before they come to the UK or to Queens especially? And uh, how do they overcome these? And what support can the university help them to overcome these challenges? Yeah, so um, I mean, lots lots of students are getting in touch as a regular about worries and concerns. One of the big thing is, um, and Inga, you kind of touched on this, is getting in touch with current students. And um, because as a staff member at Queen's, I can talk about everything, but it's not until they actually talk to you guys who are actually um, doing your research, you're in the labs, you're with the lectures, you kind of can give a real um, sort of like a true, a true authentic experience of it all. So that's one thing that we would do is um, people would get in touch. We, um, we've got a thing, and I know a lot of all the universities have a cult uni buddy, and you can go on to, you can speak to prospective students who are from your home country, who are maybe doing a similar course, and that's really good because they can talk about, because they're probably the same concerns about you as, as what you might have. Um, I know sometimes there's concerns about maybe if you've been out of studying for a while and you're going to go and do your PhD and you're thinking about how am I going to write these academic papers and things like that well we here at Queen's we have got the graduate school I'm not too sure if Zena and you could give maybe um use use their services before but they run lots of short courses and there's one um for academic writing for um students who maybe English isn't their first language so it just helps them get back into that way of things so I've got that support for students we've got the support to get chatting to students and even the whole visa process can be a little bit daunting as well and we've got support as well there. Whenever you're applying it, to make sure you're applying for the right one. To make sure, and um, I suppose with Northern Ireland, well, you fly into Northern Ireland, you can fly into Dublin, sort of all those things. And you think, where do I go to? How do I help? So we've got specific departments to help with all those queries. And the best thing is just to keep um, your contact with the university, just keep touch them with because no question silly and um, I mean we get asked all sorts of things even um you know so just just get in touch and if we can't find the answer we'll find somebody else in the university does but the best thing is just to keep in touch get talking to current students get meetings set up with potential supervisors as Yinka said do your research online find out about the culture you'll find out there's lots of maybe YouTube videos that have been specifically designed by the university but there's so many bloggers now as well you can go in you can start searching hashtags to sort of find out you know so the, there's all that to do and the more research you do and um, I know also it's a little bit different now with COVID and especially depending on where you're coming from we invite students to come prospective students to come on campus to have a look around to really get a feel for the place so and um, that's not always always feasible and um, but it is is what we can do and um, you know yeah so, and I really agree with you Patricia regarding the visa applications so I remember that I filled the visa application for myself and my husband and my son. Mm -hmm. And I was really worried like to do any single mistake in the application or not to submit a paper or mm -hmm. a visa will be refused and all those things that usually happen. So I remember I was all the time emailing the international students uh, office, mm -hmm. asking them even a very silly question. Like I remember one of the questions were, what's your passport type? So there was different names of passports. I didn't know what is the normal passport, which one is that. And I emailed them, I just screenshot the, the question and sent it to them. And they replied fast, usually the next day or after two days. 
But even my my uh, important tip for applying for visa, so try always to prepare all your documents and fill the visa as soon as possible. Don't wait to the last month to fill your application or to prepare your documents, especially for international students. You need to do some translations, uh, some, uh, some, some uh, approvals you need to obtain. So try to get them as soon as possible. Even try to apply for the visa uh, as early as you can. So you, at least in case you had any, any problem or anything that is not, uh, not correct, you can solve it right away. Also for Unibody that uh, Patricia talked about. So I'm one of the students on Unibody as an international ambassador. And I received uh, many questions from students. They feel more happy, as Patricia said, to ask questions yeah. people from their nationality. So they will have the option like to talk uh, in your own language. It's not just English. So they will feel more comfortable if you talk to them, uh, to talk to students in their own language and explain to them more about uh, what is your experience. So that's very good. Okay, so thank you very much, Zina, for that. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Patricia this question. So um, most students, so you, you deal with student recruitment, right? And um, stu some students would come with their, with their family, uh, the spouse especially in this case. Mm -hmm. How has it been in your experience of spouses being able to get jobs uh, while their partners are in their studies, uh, whether master's or PhD. Um, what's your experience like um, working with, with spouses of, of students? And um, what tips could you give for those who are considering that? Thank you. Yeah, so yeah, we do have lots of students come over with, with their spouses as well. And um, it really varies in how much we, we can help with that. You know, we, we've got, there's so many resources available. Um, the, the best thing is to make sure that they've got the right visas to come over so they can work. Um, we can then sort of point them in the direct, direct, direct direction, you know, if they're looking to maybe to, to come and work in the university themselves, we can point them in the right direction of where our jobs are coming from. Um, or else we can sort of, we do have lots of sort of like local and um, sort of like recruitment places that we, we can put them in touch with, you know. So the best thing is to sort of get in touch and we can put those those feelers out. Um, and, the, and the best thing to do is really to get it started, get it sorted as quickly as possible. And um, because sometimes these things can take a little bit of time um, and what we can do. So, so the best thing is just to get in touch early and we can sort of point in the right directions of where you can apply for jobs. And even sort of sometimes... Um, you know, they might get in touch and think, I'm going to apply for a job. Maybe they're going to say a place. And they're like, is that even close to Belfast? So things yeah. like that, we can sort of like point them in the right direction. And maybe if, you know, you might come over, you might not have a car. So you need to have somewhere that is quite... um quite local so we, we can kind of provide that advice and say well actually you're looking to apply for a job in a place that takes over an hour in a car public transport mm -hmm. that might take a little bit longer so all those kind of local things that are maybe quite hard to sort of find out on your own we can sort of help point them in the right right direction as well and even as well that science university there's contacts as well maybe with your your supervisors of, of people who might be able to suggest things that um spices can do as well Okay, thank you very much. Um, I, I would um, ask Lucas this question. Yes. So, um, having having done you started your PhD here in the UK, um, I, I would like to for some of our audience that are looking for probably not able to fund themselves but looking for research or funding opportunities for PhDs. Could you give some some tips or some um, insight about? how you got your PhD position and where people could look at for if they are looking to fund, uh, for funding uh, opportunities for their PhDs. Thank you. Uh, that's an excellent uh, question. Thank you very much for that. Uh, so I believe uh, it was quite a long time ago, but I, I, believe, I believe that I searched, uh, searched on the website uh, called Find a PhD, uh, and you can browse uh, that website uh, selecting uh, the country that is of your interest. Uh, uh, but also, before, before you even do that, I strongly recommend to go to the supervisor of your master's and ask them if they are willing to prepare a paper with you. Because uh, trust me, uh, it impressed the panel that interviewed me 
uh, for my PhD that I already had like three papers in, uh, I was a co-author of three papers in respectable uh, journals that really supported my application uh, for the scholarship. And another tip that I could give here uh, at, at the moment of the interview is to prepare a quick presentation on how you would carry out the research uh, that is in the advertising. That uh, that shows that you uh, can demonstrate, that you can take an initiative and you are are creative uh, so that's also very uh, helpful even if you are not asked to do so uh, it's still best uh, to think about it and have it in, in your head uh, obviously to me it was much easier to get that scholarship just because I'm an EU uh, citizen it's way more difficult for uh, international students uh, sadly uh, so but my colleagues at the University of Grange because the majority of them were overseas students from for example some of them of, of India I had many good colleagues from Nigeria, uh, Nigeria as well and other African countries, uh, the majority of them searched, uh, searched for some scholarships uh, through, the, uh, uh, through the websites uh, of their government, uh, as far as I remember. Some of them were also sent to do their PhD, so they had, uh, uh, they had their professional career already going on, uh, but their employers asked them to do the PhD and they were sent to do the PhD in the UK and as far as I remember they obtained the scholarship uh, so the part of it was paid by, by the uh, by, by their government and the part of it was paid uh, by, by the UK but I don't know the exact details so I don't want to give you any misinformation here. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Luca. Um, I'll probably just mention a few of those that I know that um, are very useful. So um, for those who are from countries of the Commonwealth, there's the Commonwealth uh, scholarships, and that varies from um, Commonwealth shared scholarship which are specific, uh, tied to specific courses with different universities. Um, there are also uh, PhD scholarships, uh, full master scholarships on the Commonwealth uh, website. If you want to have a look at that, they are very good um, opportunities that you could look at. And also one of the tips I would say is, um, depending on the research area that you, you are interested in, look for um, the website of research groups and contact PIs. Some of them have just won grants and they're preparing applications for, uh, they're preparing to, to send out a list of, oh, these are the PhD studentships that are available. Get in touch with them. But more importantly, you must have done your own work and make sure that you've prepared yourself so that when you are contacting these people, um, you are considered a, a, a competitive candidate. Okay, over to you, Zina, then. Uh, so uh, you're right, like I've done the, this, that I just went to the university website and I looked for um, the, the lab groups I'm interested in and just contacted the, the PI and talked to them. In my case, I didn't get a funding. It depends on the funding source or what you're looking for. But this was my way, right, a way to contact the PI and to see if first they have the availability to uh, to accept PhD students and then start to talk to them about their work and see what does suits you. So this is the main thing you have to do. But before uh, even thinking about doing a PhD, I always think you have to sit between yourself and just say why I want to do this PhD. Uh, mm. know what's your plans after the PhD? Because like you should know what you want to benefit from this PhD. Uh, think about your family, if you're having a small family that will move with you or your, your, your big family at your home country, think about financial expenses. So even sometimes of funding, like some funding, they just support the university fees, but they don't support the living expenses. Some of them, they cover everything. Uh, some, uh, some people like me, they don't get anything from all those. They just have to pay for everything, their living expenses, the university expenses. So you have to do a, like a plan for your expenses uh, how you're going to manage all these three years because you don't want just to secure one year and come here or come to any any country and then find yourself after one year that you cannot continue with the, mm. with, the, with the work. So you have to plan everything ahead and then follow a, a, a good plan to just uh, uh, do what you want or to obtain, uh, to apply for a PhD and obtain your visa. 
Yeah, if I'm uh, just add a few, uh, comment, please. Um, at this moment, so we've talked a lot about those who wants to do PhD. So I'm looking at those who want to establish research careers. And one of the very useful websites where you get, it's like a big repository of, of uh, research opportunity and jobs in the UK is jobs.ac.uk. So aside from individual university websites, which would have all the jobs they're advertising, jobs.ac.uk has almost everything that you'll find on the individual university website would also be advertised on jobs.ac.uk. So that way you would you could explore the landscape of what's available in which university, what area, and then uh, based on what everyone had discussed before, start contacting prospective people uh, in those university and ask your questions before you make your applications. So thank you. That's right. Thank you. So uh, now I just want to ask Lucas. So Lucas, yes. you, as I mentioned, that you are going to move now to Ireland for doing a, a new job in industry. So uh, what's your what, what's your plan like for this job? Uh, why did you what why did you choose this job here in Ireland? And uh, what you're aiming from from this job after you finish it or. Uh, Yes, after you finish it. So what's your aim from this? And if you have the chance to then move back to Poland or stay in Ireland or in the, the UK, what uh, what are your options? Thank you very much, Zina. Uh, so first of all, uh, I would like to uh, gain new skills because I will have the opportunity to work with whole genome sequencing or uh, with the identification of microbiota using NGS technique as well. And that's very interesting to me. And uh, in uh, um, uh, in uh, it, it relates to what I want to do in the future. Uh, moreover, uh, this job uh, will focus on probiotics, and I've been working with probiotics for the last two years. And also the goal of that project that I'm going to join is to eliminate uh, the usage of antibiotics in the treatment of pigs uh, uh, by uh, providing them with, uh, with probiotics. And I, I think uh, the, the idea standing behind it is great. So I, I'm very eager to join them. Uh, and after I completed, because it's, because it's for, at least for now, it's only six month uh, contract. I think that I'm uh, I'm going to stay in Ireland because uh, I would like to work, generally speaking, I would like to work uh, with probiotics or uh, with fermentation technologies, generally speaking. Uh, and uh, this uh, type of industry practically doesn't exist in Poland. So uh, Ireland or the UK provide me more opportunities to continue the career that I really want and that, that I'm really interested in. That's, uh, that's excellent. Yes, so also I would like to give um, some tips for students who want to, to continue their PhD in the UK or even in any other place, but just those are important tips. I feel that I would like to know them before I do my PhD before. So um, it's not just when you come to do your PhD, it's not just your PhD and your research and don't just leave yourself in, in the lab and just do lab work, try to engage with the outer community with the scientific community like us here how we are involved in this session um, try to uh, to establish your name or establish your career in advance because it's not just about what you're doing in the lab it's just also about your um, communication skills about how you're having your uh, your relationship with other people uh, how you're engaging more and more and learning more things it's not just what you're learning in your phd you have to learn about everything around you and to be not an expert, but just at, at least to have information about most of the things. So that will be great. So there, you'll have many opportunities within the university. You have the student union as what we have in Queens or the graduate school, or even from different societies. Try to engage yourself and to, to talk to people uh, at your level or even higher from your level like postdocs and learn from their experiences. Yes. yes, and if I may add something, uh, I also think, uh, I absolutely agree with Zina that uh, you need to take your time, uh, use your time during your, uh, while you are doing your, your PhD to get involved in some extra uh, activities. When I was doing my PhD, I had two other jobs. Uh, I was collaborating with the industry already, uh, and that helped me to build my net network. That's, that's the first thing. And another thing is that I gained many 
uh, skills that I wouldn't be able to gain uh, while staying at the university. Because when you apply for a research grant, uh, uh, the application form looks a little bit different from those that you uh, help to prepare uh, uh, with your industry partners. That's, that's the first thing. But also uh, collaborating with the industry taught me how to implement some ideas based on science into a real world because that's 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 the trickiest part, let's be honest. Uh, so absolutely go for it, uh, uh, get in, uh, engaged into various societies, but but also uh, try to find if you manage to find the time uh, try uh, to find some part time job and that will definitely help you uh, to uh, uh, to enhance your chances uh, in pursuing the career that you really want yes sure part time jobs are an excellent opportunity and it's good for your cv yeah. if you want to apply for post yes job. yes so it's not just what you have done in your uh, in the lab or what's what the thesis about it's about also the extra uh, things that they will make you more favorable and when you are applying for a postdoc job. Yeah, no, just to follow up for you guys are saying, it's, that's what we find. We really encourage students whenever they, they come to Queen's to really get involved. And there's so many opportunities that can open up. You know, Zena helps me and she does a couple of recruitment things. And that opens up a whole a whole world of opportunity. And yes, it means you get a little bit more extra payment coming in at the end of the month, which is always good. You also get a chance to meet people from not necessarily sort of your research and their, the school university which you're studying in, but it can open up. I can see looking at previous um, student ambassadors that came to work for me. There's maybe, um, well, someone's came to me and said, I need somebody to do this. I'm able to suggest them. You know, there's lots and lots of opportunities and you can really then expand your contacts and really, um, you know, the more you put into it, the more you get out and who knows where you could be. You come to university not knowing anyone and leaving and you've got so many contacts. And um, that you could just travel throughout the world, visiting them and doing different research. So definitely get involved as much as you can inside the labs and your research, but also out of that as well, because it'll make it a really good experience and make you more employable as well. When you're applying for jobs, you can say, I've done these all these extra stuff too. So really, really good points. Yeah, I would just add add to what Patricia just said in uh, the sense that if you um, eventually make the move to the UK, one of the things that could be of very immense benefit in building your networks and getting experiences is getting um, active with your professional societies. Now that, well, I would hope that most of the people um, listening today would be a, a microbiologist, but even if you are in other research area or you're interested in your research in other uh, professional areas, get involved with the professional societies because there are opportunities, for example, leadership opportunities. They have um, an opportunity for a member to represent them in parliament, in different policy environment. You have the opportunity to develop those wider contacts and connections, which would be very much useful um, after whether it's a job or uh, it's a research that you're doing or studies that you're doing at the moment. So professional societies is very is a very uh, vital tool that could also be, be useful. Thank you very much, Inka. I think that, uh, that I'm hoping that uh, we will be able to, to help at least one person, but to help them uh, uh, to enhance that, uh, that chance, I would like to uh, get, uh, turn to the questions that were asked from our, our audience. And the first question comes from uh, Paul Akinduti. I'm hoping that I'm pronouncing the name right. <laughs> okay, so the question is, it seems very difficult to get, get postdoc at the UK University. Kindly, kindly provide more information on getting postdoc at UK University. And Inka, I think that you, you are the best candidate <laughs> okay. to answer that question. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much, uh, Lucas and um, Paul, for, for sending that question. So the probably a few routes to get in a postdoc in the university. And I'll talk first about uh, the most common route, which is um, usually when PIs, that's principal investigators, um, get research funding, the funding is to address particular questions and they would need people 
to do those researches. And I mentioned jobs.ac.uk and those individual university website as the primary point where they advertise these positions. Now, it might not come with the name postdoc. In some universities like us, it's a research fellow. It, it could be a postdoctoral research associate in some universities, but essentially those are project specific um, or, or funding specific opportunities that they need people with those skills to accomplish. So if you look at those websites and they advertise those positions, if you meet those skill sets that they require, I would say that you would have the opportunity of getting um, interviewed and hopefully even getting the job. So that's the first project specific funding through the university. Another is if you apply for your own external funding. So for example, I know there is the Newton Fellowship which um, is, is uh, applicable and people who are eligible are researchers with their PhDs from different parts of the world could apply to that. If you get the fellowship, now one of the processes of that obviously would be you need to get a host institution. So you would need to do your research, contact someone that is in the research area that you are proposing or is an expert in that area, and you both will work together if they agree to host you for the fellowship. You will work on that application together. And if you get your funding, you can then come to the university. So those are the two major routes that the, they are funding from PIs as well as you getting your independent uh, funding from other external sources and bringing it into university. But most importantly is finding people whose research interests align with yours and start that communication with them even before those opportunities come so that when, whether it's funding from them or you are interested in an external funding, you already have uh, a PI who is happy to have you in their lab and there will be a suitable funding opportunity to go with that. So I, I hope I answered Paul's question. Thank you very much, Inka. And perhaps Patricia have, uh, have something to contribute to your answer. Uh, does your office also support postgraduate students and, and also those who are uh, seeking postdoc positions? Yeah, so no, um, it's exactly what Inka is saying, that yes, we, we can support that, that, that students do need to do their research that um, and they can do the research, make sure there's the right areas that, that, that we offer or whatnot, and we can we can point you in the right direction so that you'll have the conversations with the right people. Um, and it's definitely one of those things. If you've done your research and you're very keen and you're keen and you're very eager and, um, you know, there maybe isn't an opportunity at that present time when you get in touch but you know if you can do that make that connection and we can point in the right direction with the right people it means that something may pop up in the future and they'll be able yeah. to get back in touch or whatnot and think you know I was chatting to somebody and they actually had really strong um expression interest in something or anything right now but you know and later so it's definitely to, to get in touch make those connections and um you know if there's not something at the minute it could be something that develops later on you know um throughout the year Brilliant, Patricia. Thank you very much. So now we have another question here. So um, I think it will be I'll be able to answer this question. So from Juliette, what advice do you give to single mothers coming to the UK to do a PhD? So this is a little bit difficult question. It depends on how many children do you have. Like one is not similar to two or three. It depends on their age group. So if they are uh, still small, so you have to sort out first the uh, where the nursery, where they are gonna be and the expenses, you have to make sure that you, the expenses suits you. Uh, if they are in the school, you have to also make sure uh, uh, how they will admit the school here and the admission process and their schedule, all these important information and also about supporting them financially uh, for the kids. From my experience, like uh, when I entered the university, even my undergraduate pharmacy degree, my son, he was two years. So all my life I was studying with a child. So you will see that it's uh, sometimes it will be hard. It's interesting. It's an interesting experience, but it's sometimes hard. But I was able to manage this. I have only just one boy. But when he was just two years and I was doing exams in my pharmacy degree, it was a little bit hard. They will be sometimes sick. Uh, 
sometimes they will be they want their mother beside them but you are having other 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 things you have to do but you cannot tell them no so you have to to manage and you have to remember that you will have um, to just force yourself more on work you will not sleep enough you are going to stay until night just because you want to balance between your life and your and being a student and at the end like i graduated with the first class honors and pharmacy so this didn't affect me because i was all the time trying to make him happy and make myself happy at the same time so uh, it's, it's it's not easy it's a little bit hard but if you want to achieve this you can do it like no one can stop you if you're having kids or no or even if you're a single mother you can manage everything and you'll find support from your university or depends uh, from the work you're in or your the the work place you are in but always remember that you can do it whatever the circumstances you're having you are you can do it if you just manage your time try to balance uh, your your uh, your work life balance and you can do it nothing can stop you yeah. brilliant that was very inspirational zina thank you very much and we have another question from Juliet as well. Uh, she's asking us about uh, uh, about uh, uh, expenses, about the, the living costs. So firstly, I think that uh, it is fair to say that it all depends on the city where you are applying and where you are going to stay. Uh, and differences are very significant. Uh, obviously, uh, London would be the, the most one of the most expensive choice, choices. From uh, what I heard from Zina, Belfast uh, is much more affordable. But uh, perhaps Patricia will throw a little light on that aspect. Yeah. So, um, Queens, it is. The student living costs and accommodation costs, it is um, the lowest in the UK. So it is now, um, there's just a real, it really depends what you're looking to go for as well. I mean, if you decide to come to Belfast, there is student, um, there's accommodation um, specific for students and they it ranges, I think it's about £81 per week. Um, from the, For the sort of the more basic ones, you can then have um, your en suite, you can have a, an enclosed flat. Um, then there's lots of options as well if you decide you want to rent privately as well and um, so there's things like that to think about and um, your cost of living it really um it depends and um, depends on your lifestyle as well you know you maybe are a person who's, who's quite frugal and and doesn't maybe go out that much or you know so it's all those different things you think about I think you really do need to plan beforehand and sort of um make sure you have that that income going through and um, especially if you are studying you know depending on um how much work's going on with, with your PhD or whatnot and um, if you have that extra time to then get a job on top of that that um as well so there's so many different things you need to think about but um yeah do do look at your universities you know and um, as I say if you go to London there will be higher costs and than, than maybe somewhere outside London we're slightly lower costs compared to the mainland UK so so that really does because as Zena says you don't maybe want to have thunder and what for one year and then what about the rest of your years you really do need to, to think ahead um, as well because you, you do need that, that support and it's not something you want to be stressed you know you'll be enough stress and working without having to think about those living costs so do you have in your head sort of what kind of lifestyle you want to, to, to lead and do some research online I mean you can go on to if you start searching for private rent you know maybe in Belfast it'll give you an idea of what kind of costs as well and we can through the university can recommend sort of areas to stay in and sort of head out of but um after that, do you think about all those extra living costs too? Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much, Patricia. And I can see that there are more and more questions coming. Uh, we don't have much time. However, I think there are a few that are uh, that still need needs to be addressed by us. Uh, okay, so the question is: Is there any age uh, restriction? Uh, so, Inka, I think that you would be best to answer that question. Okay, thanks, Lucas. I, I would say no, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. What's most important is your skill set. If you're able to deliver, if you have what's expected and you're able to deliver on the project that's uh, been advertised, there is no age uh, restriction as far well, because that would even be uh, uh, a discrimination uh, point. So, which you usually universities uh, would definitely not be be uh, supporting. So, um, age, I don't think, should be a challenge. Okay. 
And uh, if I may add something, uh, usually the only requirement is that uh, you uh, uh, you are supposed to, to, uh, to do your PhD uh, uh, no longer than three years prior to starting a uh, postdoc position. Uh, I think it's quite common uh, when you search through uh, various advertisings. Yeah, if they if they have that requirement, they would state it. As long as it's not stated, then yes. it's not the challenge. Yeah. I think it all depends on your experience and your CV and how well you suit this, uh, this job. So uh, we have another question here from Muhammad Hafiz. Uh, in this COVID situation, is there any opportunity to do postdoc with supervisor in the UK, but running part of the lab work in my current, in, uh, in my current, in my country? Uh, I think he means that about uh, with COVID situation, can you uh, find a postdoc job? I think it depends on the funding for the postdoc jobs, but I think I can answer this also. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll probably uh, be able to make one or two thoughts. So it would be, so those projects or the project specifically will depend on, you will need resources. So if, for example, it's a lab-based work, most of the time those projects would be suitable most for the lab that advertised it. So um, the facilities for doing the things that you need might not be available elsewhere. But obviously in the uh, in the era of, of COVID, um, PIs are being more flexible and all of that. There are discussions, if they are not lab-based uh, work, there probably will be discussions that could be had in that regard. Because for example, if it's a majorly computational research there might be discussions that could be had but because usually postdocs are jobs and they are if you are non-eu or non-uk person there might be restrictions on your visas etc so that might limit the 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 extent of the flexibility of working within your home country as well as taking a job in the uk would be but by all means have the discussion with whoever the PI would be and within the rules of what's uh, acceptable, that something could be worked out. So our last question for today is um, uh, about how about from Israel, I don't know if I pronounced the name right. So how best can one plan going with one spouse? So this uh, also from my experience, you can apply, like according to the UK regulations, you can apply for your spouse and he can come with you legally to the UK. Uh, for your visa, you are going to get a maximum of, of, of 20 hours per week to work. But for the spouse visa, he can work unlimited time. So if you come with your spouse, uh, he can work uh, according to the UK visa, except for some jobs, which I remember are something like related to medicine or to being a physician or something. Yes, but other jobs, they can work. Uh, also, they can look um, uh, work as a part-time jobs or full-time jobs. So there is no restrictions for this. So it's uh, it's quite easy, like to apply for the visa. And and if you um, you you fill all the requirements, they will be granted the visa for sure. If everything is according to the regulations. So uh, I don't think that we have more now. More questions for today. So. Uh, Thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you for Lucas, for Inka, for, Thank you. for uh, answering all these questions. It was really very helpful. Uh, our next session will be uh, human microbiome and its role in disease and infection. That will start at 3.30 uh, uh, p.m. with a talk from the Dr. Gizli in our son. So uh, I'm very excited for this session. So just hold on and wait for, for the next session. Thank you so much for joining us today and hope you enjoyed our session. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.